Let's talk about the synthesis of lysergic acid, the precursor to the psychoactive drug LSD. Let's be clear, this video does not endorse the synthesis or use of illegal drugs. Why are we talking about the LSD precursor then? Well, lysergic acid derivatives such as bromocryptine and pergolite are actually used in the treatment of early stage Parkinson's disease or type 2 diabetes. This sometimes life-saving utility of natural product derivatives is a reoccurring theme in total synthesis and a much more legitimate reason for us to look at lysergic acid. Whether you're a high school student with basic chemistry knowledge, chemistry undergrad, an expert in the field or just a random bloke on an acid trip, I hope that this video will help you learn something new about the history and synthetic strategies towards lysergic acid. Before we dive into any details, let's look at how this video will be structured. Firstly, we'll briefly drill down on the history that precedes the chemical synthesis of lysergic acid. We'll uncover an unknown secret in chemistry history and the excessive smoking habits of old school organic chemists. Secondly, we'll look at the strategy of the first total synthesis of lysergic acid by chemists at Lilly and the legendary Robert Burns Woodward. If you're a very advanced high school student or an undergrad, the chemistry discussed in this part could be in the realm of your current knowledge. Thirdly, we'll look at a modern approach towards lysergic acid. This will serve as a fantastic case study to see how synthetic methods and strategies evolved over the last century. This part will contain more complex organometallic chemistry and a discussion of reaction mechanism. I want to explicitly warn you that if you're not familiar with organic synthesis, you will get lost somewhere along the ride. That's totally fine though, just stay for the part you can understand and please listen to my closing remarks at the end of the video. This first video is one of many to come and is geared towards a wide audience, so just tell me whether you'd like to see easy or more advanced videos in the future. There are plenty of resources on the history of LSD, both objectively documented ones and ones that are romanticized by hippies. The short version is the following. Swiss chemist Albert Hoffmann prepared LSD for the first time semi-synthetically in 1938 at Sondo. Semi-synthetically means that he modified natural products from grain fungi that can be isolated from nature and prepared different analogues thereof. For a long time, semi-synthesis was the only way to access complex natural products and it remains a highly useful tool for drug discovery and development. Bromocryptine, the Parkinson's drug we've talked about in the beginning, is made semi-synthetically on a large scale nowadays. It was only five years later in 1943 that after some accidental and intentional self-experiments, Hoffmann discovered the psychoactive properties of this lysergic acid derivative. Let's admire his documentation habits in his lab journal. That day and his ensuing bike ride home while tripping on LSD is actually celebrated by LSD enthusiasts as the Bicycle Day. If you're interested about more comments from Hoffman himself, there's a link in the description. By the way, I've personally worked in that very area where the old Sondo buildings were located and where Hoffman did his work. This was back in the good old days where chemists did not fear analyzing their products by literally ingesting them. As a side note, a lot of the structural determination of carbohydrates by another chemistry legend, Emil Fischer, also relied on taste testing and olfactory senses. Okay, now let's get to the bloody interesting part, the actual synthesis. It was not until 1949 that the chemical structure of lysergic acid was actually determined. Back in those days, structural analysis was a master's craft and it was a challenge to even know what your target molecule actually looked like. This elucidation set the stage for the first total synthesis of lysergic acid, which was reported in 1954. Mistakenly, the synthesis is often solely attributed to Robert Woodward. In actuality, Ed Kornfeld at Lilly designed and executed the synthesis and Woodward was only indirectly involved as a consultant. Nevertheless, 
Woodward's other pioneering syntheses of targets such as quinine, cortisone or vitamin B12 and his mechanistic work represented a quantum leap in chemistry that ultimately earned him the Nobel Prize in 1965. Feel free to tell me in the comments if you'd like to see a video on Woodward. There's actually a video on the Lily Woodward synthesis on YouTube already. With no intended disrespect, I however want to take a real chemist's point of view before we blindly dive into the forward synthesis and take everything for granted. Chemists rarely approach problems in a forward sense but actually reverse engineer the problem at hand with the help of retrosynthetic analysis. Let's try to actually understand the why of the key steps and precautions that were taken by the team. Let's consider the architecture of lysergic acid. Of the plethora of possible retrosynthetic disconnections possible, the Lily Woodward synthesis actually decided to access lysergic acid from its dihydroindole analog. Why would they do this? After all, regular unsaturated indoles are readily available and have a lot of well known chemistry, you might wonder. Well, the reason is twofold. Firstly, indoles can be highly reactive due to their nucleophilicity and thus incompatible with some synthetic transformations, even if the indole nitrogen is masked with a protecting group. You can think of protecting groups as a method of disarming the high reactivity of a functional group. The chemical methods back then were harsher as well and less forgiving, so this decrease in undesired reactivity would decrease competitive side reactions in every single step taken. Secondly, in this specific system, another unproductive side reaction plagued previous attempts of synthesizing lysergic acid using a regular indole. This is the irreversible isomerization of the indole system to the more stable naphthalenoid isomer. This isomerization was encountered in intermediates possessing the tricyclic system and an additional double bond, and thus severely limited the flexibility of the approach. To circumvent these problems, the team designed their synthesis with the dihydroindole moiety instead of a regular indole. If you at any point in time feel like you can't keep up, just pause the video to digest the structures and reactions for a moment. Okay, so now we've managed to simplify our problem by one single step. What about everything else? To save time, let's assume that the acid that is appended to the six-membered ring on the top can be accessed from the corresponding cyclic ketone via regular functional group interconversions and a on carbon homologation. Why should we target this ketone? Well, the now present alpha beta unsaturated ketone is a keying element for the aldol condensation. This allows us to break up one of the rings and make our problem, again, just a small step simpler. Let's assume that we can access this diketone from this ketone here via an alpha functionalization. That leaves us with this aryl ketone. If you've already took some chemistry courses, you've probably heard about the electrophilic aromatic substitution and the Friedel-Crafts acylation, and this is the perfect opportunity to apply that knowledge. This means that we can forge the tricyclic system from this acyl chloride. The acyl chloride can in turn be accessed by reduction, protection and activation of this indole acid starting material. We've now traced back the Lily Woodward synthesis to its starting materials. If you feel overwhelmed, don't worry. We've only considered the key disconnections of the retro synthesis so far and ignored some steps. Now we will fill in the blanks when we look at the forward synthesis. The Lily Woodward synthesis commenced with partial hydrogenation of our starting material with rainy nickel to afford the dihydroindole system for the purpose we outlined at the beginning. Next, the dihydroindole nitrogen was protected as the benzoyl amide and the acid converted to the acyl chloride. This set the stage for the first key reaction, the Friedel-Crafts acylation with aluminum chloride as a Lewis acid. The resulting aryl ketone was photolytically brominated in the alpha position. If you're at an undergrad chemistry level, Think about why the authors didn't choose, for example, basic conditions for the alpha bromination. Next, 
the sidechain containing the second ketone masked as an acetal was introduced by nucleophilic substitution. Deep protection of the acetal afforded the diketone that is required for a second key transformation, the intramolecular aldol condensation. Pay attention to the fact that this deep protection also accidentally deprotected the dihydroindole amine, so we will need to reintroduce a protecting group again later on. After the aldol condensation under basic conditions took place and the amine was protected again, we ended up with the enone, which we still need to transform to the ring appended acid. The team achieved this through 1 2 reduction of the enone and conversion of the resulting hydroxyl group to the corresponding chloride. The next step, substitution of the chloride with cyanide, might look simple on paper but was literally deadly in practice. Due to the high instability of the chloride precursor in normal solvents, the team had to perform the cyanide substitution in liquid HCN as a solvent. Hydrogen cyanide was used in World War I as a chemical weapon and was one of the components of German Cyclone B in World War II. This really highlights the expertise and ballsiness of old school chemists. There's an amusing experimental note that you might have heard about already, where a chemist called Gottermann actually recommended to smoke a cigarette while preparing HCN. Doing so, one should quickly notice a characteristic flavor while smoking, should there be any leaks in the apparatus. Let's finish the forward synthesis. After the cyanide group was converted to the methyl ester, it was subsequently hydrolyzed to a 43 acid. As a last step, dehydrogenation of the dihydroindole system was accomplished using heat deactivated rainy nickel as a catalyst in the presence of sodium arsenate. Other conditions generally showed different regioselectivity and only gave the undesired naphthalenoid isomer. Actually, making LSD from lysergic acid is just one amide formation away and a piece of cake. This concludes the Lily Woodward synthesis of lysergic acid. If you're confused about some transformations or terminology, you can always go through the synthesis a second time on your own. If you really want to test your understanding, really think about the mechanisms of every step in this synthesis. Please tell me in the comments whether this was information overload already or whether it was suited to your knowledge level. Now, let's talk about even more complex transformations and modern chemistry. The Lily Woodward synthesis employed a lot of basic but robust reactions. How does a modern approach to lysergic acid look like? As you might have guessed already, chemists don't chain smoke in labs next to explosive chemicals anymore, and the use of hydrogen cyanide as a solvent isn't anyone's favorite either. What about synthetic strategies and disconnections? Let's take a look at an asymmetric synthesis of lysergic acid, published in 2011 by Professor Hiraoki Ono and co-workers at Kyoto University. Instead of going through the dihydroindole, like the Lily Woodward team did, and assembling lysergic acid in a very stepwise fashion, Ono's team took a more direct approach. Their first retrosynthetic simplifications were to access the carboxylic acid from the corresponding alcohol via oxidation and epimerization, so nothing really fancy here. I want to remind you that in our discussion, stereochemical considerations and diastereoselectivities are largely ignored to keep it somewhat simple. Next, they realized that the olefin aryl linkage was a keying element for transition metal mediated coupling reactions. They envisioned a domino reaction where two rings could be formed in one single step. An aryl bromide would function as an initiating group for palladium and subsequently forge the tetracyclic ring system via intramolecular amino palladation of an allene starting material. Before you freak out and ask yourself how people can see such disconnections, Bear in mind that it all comes down to practice and reference reactions that you know of. In most cases, research groups discover these key steps in model systems way before they even know what total synthesis they will apply them to. Often, it is only after establishing a new methodology that people actually start thinking about finding targets that could be constructed with this new reaction. 
The allene starting material for this reaction was synthesized from this propergylic alcohol by a reaction we won't really talk about in detail. The carbinol carbon is a chiral center and installing chiral oxygen substituents is often achieved by enantioselective epoxidation of alkenes. This means that we would need a way to regioselectively reduce and open the corresponding epoxide. The enine starting material for the epoxidation again calls for transition metal mediated coupling reactions. This time the highly useful Sonogashira coupling was employed. The precursor vinyl bromide can be accessed from the aldehyde via olefination. If you're confused and got your hopes shattered already, this last reaction might be one that you've already heard of. It's an electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction, the wilsmeyer hawk reaction, which gives us this simple indole as the starting material. To save some time, let's only talk about the most interesting step of this synthesis in the forward sense, the epoxide reduction. I've earlier mentioned the need for a regioselective process, but what does that mean? Can you identify which sites could potentially be susceptible to reduction with a hydride reagent and which one is the most reactive? What happens if you employ a Lewis acid as an additive? To the advanced people in the audience that have been bored so far, what potential side products do you expect? I promise you that you most likely didn't think of at least one. Let's reveal the answer to the first question. In theory, there are three reactive carbons. Both oxyrane carbons that can open up the epoxide in a SN2 fashion and the alkyne carbon which could be reduced and open up the epoxide in a SN2 prime fashion. Let's now have a look at what products Ono's group found when they investigated different conditions. In addition to the desired product, both this isomeric exocyclic olefin and this ketone were isolated as side products. Can we rationalize their formation? Let's go step by step here. Because the epoxide opening is Lewis acid assisted, the first step of the mechanism is the formation of an indolium intermediate that contains a delocalized positive charge. This is where the reducing agent sodium cyanoborohydride comes into play. It can reduce the indolium cation at two sites with paths A and B leading to the formation of the two isomers. What about the ketone? It's the result from pathway C, a Meinwald rearrangement of the epoxide that consists of an intramolecular 1-2 hydride shift. This doesn't consume the external hydride, but has been reported to be formed with up to 52% yield. Very surprising indeed. This should remind us that even though we can plan our experiments on paper, the real outcomes are not always as predictable or even considered beforehand takes very clever fine-tuning of reaction conditions and a lot of hard work and analysis in the lab to complete such an endeavor. This mechanistic discussion concludes this first video. Please comment, like and subscribe if you found this interesting and informative. Put a lot of effort into this and appreciate your feedback. Tell me how you like the structure, content and difficulty of the chemistry. Did the history part bore you or was it a fun prologue to the synthesis? And should I do more videos on more simple syntheses, such as the Lily Woodward one, or do you want to see more complex and expeditious approaches? Thank you for staying with me up to this point and please subscribe if you want to see more of these videos.